As much as I believe Rivian are actually going to go bankrupt, I do love the company. I don't want them to go bankrupt, but also don't want you to lose your money by investing in a company where, well, you're likely to lose your money. That said, the CEO of Rivian, I think he's actually a very, very intelligent CEO, and he could do a good job leading a certain company starting with T. But anyhow, on another note, Rivian CEO has revealed where he believes the future of batteries is. And, well, I think he needs to be brought up to date on a recent uh, innovation, which he might not be aware of. But that aside, his comments on solid-state batteries and lithium-ion phosphate are really interesting. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the channel. I'm Sam Evans. You're watching The Electric Viking. Someone should really tell Rivian's CEO, RJ Scarringe, that um, the new sodium batteries from Cadle, the Nextra batteries, uh, he needs to know about them. He needs to know about them. I don't think he does yet. Anyhow, EV batteries keep getting better and better and better. Uh, you know, one of the things that are getting better about EV batteries, it's not even the fact that they're getting better. Yeah, that's true that they are. But what's also getting better is our knowledge about them. And actually, some of the uh, engineers from Chinese car companies have told me in person that actually what the problem was with some of the batteries was they just hadn't done enough testing to know how long the batteries would last if they smashed tons of charge into them, like we're talking, you know, five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred kilowatt, and they just hadn't done the testing. They didn't know how long they'd last, so they didn't want to do this. And then they discovered, actually, these batteries are better than we thought. So in a way, we just didn't know how good batteries were until we did the testing and then discovered that actually the, the batteries we already had were better than what we thought. Rivian CEO RG Scarringe though he thinks there's still room for improvement. During an interview this week on the Plugged In podcast, Scarringe told Inside EVs that his startup's main focus was on the battery front, that is making EVs charge faster without sacrificing range. Shorter public charging stops would make owning an EV far more convenient, especially for road trips and people who can't charge at home. But he said it's not that easy. Faster charging generally is at odds with a cell's energy density. This is true, actually. Look at BOD have two new blade batteries. One of them they haven't even, for some reason, begun making yet. I don't know why, but um, they talked about it 12 months ago. So they're two new batteries. One of them has higher energy density. I believe it's about 185 to 190 watt hours per kilogram, which for LFP would put it BOD back up with you know some of the best in the world. Because BYD's blade battery currently is only 165. It's actually the lowest energy density LFP battery you can currently get on the mainstream battery market for cars. But the other version of BYD's blade battery, it's the version 2, right? That's already in the BYD Han L and the BYD Tang L. That is an energy density of 175 watt hours per kilogram, which is not bad. But that's the version of the battery that can charge at 1000 kilowatt. The higher energy density version of the battery can't charge at that speed. So yeah, the higher energy density of the batteries are there. That's when you start to struggle with charging them really, really fast. Scarringe says that you can make a battery that charges lightning quick, but it may not hold very much energy, resulting in an EV that can't go as far. That's part of why it takes anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes to add a significant charge to most EVs in America. He claims that. We try to find the right balance on those, but we're increasingly focusing on fast charging without losing energy density as we've known it thus far. Chinese firms have been working on this. BYD made waves when it said its cars can charge at 1000 kilowatt. Now I should say, there's only two models, the Han L and the Tang L. They're only available in China. None of BYD's other cars actually get that battery yet. That's not a mainstream battery yet. And Scarringe believes that those BYD cars don't offer enough range for the size of battery. They're too heavy. And to be fair, I think he's right. Now, the other challenge with boosting fast charging capability, Rivian CEO said, is that it deals a blow to a battery's longevity. That's not necessarily true, actually. With some of these newer lithium ion phosphate batteries, that appears not to be the case. However, Scarin said, we can fast charge really quickly, but you kill the durability of the cell. Over the course of, say, let's say 1,000 charge cycles, you could lose 20 to 25% of the original capacity of the cell. 
Now, I should point out that the big test done by Recurrent in the United States, looking at 13,000 Tesla owners, in that situation, many of those Tesla owners DC fast charged their cars every single day for years. And their battery degradation wasn't as high as what RJ was referencing. So I don't know if that's Tesla's architecture or if Tesla just has more or we just have more data. Rivian is exploring chemistry tweaks like silicon anodes and dialing and targeting those toward fast charge, said Scarage. Is also implementing packaging improvements that can make its batteries more cost effective, which is key since batteries are the single most expensive component of any EV. Rivian's upcoming R2 crossover uses much larger cells than its first generation R1S and R1T pickup trucks and SUVs. The new cells are assembled in a single layout rather than a double-decker stack. The new pack also doubles as a structural part of the car. Scarrange says all of this has cut a tremendous amount of cost out. Just think about the cost of a battery. Everything other than the chemistry is overhead. That's there to hold the chemistry and connect it all together so it's not adding value, he said. So, very similar concept to BMW and other companies as well, like Tesla, for example, going from 2170 battery cells, so pretty small ones, to bigger 4680 size batteries. That's basically what Rivian are doing as well. When he was asked about solid state, though, I thought he, his response was interesting. I think there's a lot of noise in solid state around commercial readiness. That's maybe an exaggeration of reality, he said. Many battery companies and automakers have been working on solid state batteries, and they're all very keen, particularly Toyota and Nissan and all very keen to get investors to believe they have solid state batteries. He said this, you're seeing polymer based batteries. There's people that are looking at sodium. So there's a whole host of different things being looked at. But the question is, can they get to scale, said Scarage. When it comes to sodium based batteries, I think we already know the answer. I think Scarage already knows the answer to that question. Uh, if it's Cato that's making them, if it's the biggest battery company in the world that's um, making them, and they have a, an energy density higher than BBD's blade battery, yeah? And they can last for 3.6 million miles before they even hit 80% battery degradation. Then it's game over for the, the majority of the industry. It's that simple. There's no other way to argue around that. Uh, they're cheaper as well. Did I mention that? 50% cheaper than lithium ion phosphate batteries at the pack level, 50% cheaper at the pack level, the same energy density, perform better in extreme temperatures, uh, can perform in up to minus 40 degrees Celsius and plus 70 degrees Celsius. There's no other battery in the world that actually meets all these requirements. Clearly, LFP um, is going to have a big challenge on its hands. Rivian CEO says the two chemistries that already dominate the EV landscape will remain the most important. Those are high nickel cells and cheaper lithium ion phosphate ones known as LFP. The reason he said this is because LFP is known for its hardiness and affordability. However, as LFP packs gain share across China and Europe, they won't be much of a factor in the US due to trade barriers, said Scarage. China controls nearly the entire global supply of LFP. The United States, because of our trade relationships with China, has very, very low LFP penetration. I think it will likely stay low in the United States unless we see a shift in trade policy. So, I agree with Scarage. On the one hand, I think the penetration of sodium batteries and LFP won't be particularly high in the US because of the trade problems. I mean, obviously, it's true that Tesla, General Motors, and Ford all plan to make lithium ion phosphate factories in the US on licensed technology from Cadel. Now, the question is with an extra battery, why would they even license the LFP tech when they can license the sodium tech, which actually is better and cheaper? Who knows what's going to happen? But when it comes to the rest of the world, if we kind of ignore the United States because that's a bit of a cluster, you know what I mean, then I think it's very, very clear what is going to happen. Over the next five to 10 years, the lithium market will be annihilated by sodium batteries, absolutely annihilated because 50% cost reduction with no downsides and only upsides, there is no possible way that lithium ion phosphate or any type of lithium battery can compete with that. At the very high end of the market, obviously, solid state batteries will take market share, but we're talking very small percentages, maybe 5% in that premium section of the market. Remember, this is early days for sodium batteries and they're already at 175 watt hours per kilogram. Early days, right? 
If this, if this can be done in early days, in five years from now, we're going to see 200 plus watt hours per kilogram from these sodium batteries, which have, you know, like I said, all the advantages of lithium ion phosphate, all the advantages and none of the disadvantages, such as their challenges in extreme temperatures. What are your thoughts? Thanks for watching.